Okay, good day to everyone. My name is River Arlis Emelantok, and I, along with my groupmate, John Paul E. Jaspe, will be presenting our thesis report entitled Monitoring of Peripheral Vascular Disease Using Neurofuzzy Algorithm and Wireless Body Sensor Network. So for the introduction, peripheral vascular disease, or PVD, also known as peripheral arterial disease, or PAD, is a cardiovascular condition that mainly affects the arms and legs of the victim. So PVD is actually more common amongst the elderly and several at-risk groups such as diabetics, smokers, and those with a history of cardiovascular diseases. So if left untreated, PVD can actually result in an increased risk for other diseases like coronary heart disease and stroke, and eventually these severe symptoms would lead to death. So PVD is actually a very serious and somewhat common cardiovascular ailment. And despite its seriousness, it's actually also one of the least diagnosed according to recent medical studies. As a result of this research gap, the main objectives of this study are to, to develop a PVD monitoring system using ECG and PPG sensors so that the monitoring system will be non-invasive in nature, to train a neurofuzzy algorithm for using the system, this particular algorithm will be used to, de to determine the patient's ABI since the uh, patient's ABI, which stands for ankle brachial index, is the main variable used in determining whether a patient has PVD or not. And then, of course, to test and verify the accuracy of the developed system using various statistical treatments and to de design and integrate an application that will allow users to view the data gathered by the device. So while I mentioned earlier that PVD can result in the development of other cardiovascular ailments, this study will only be limited to the monitoring of PVD. So other diseases such as coronary heart disease and stroke and other related diseases apart from those will only be mentioned in passing in this study. So to summarize the RRL of this study, uh, there have been multiple attempts in recent years to develop a monitoring system for peripheral vascular disease. However, these developments are usually invasive in nature. For example, a recent study uh, promoted the use of endoscopy or endoscopy-related operations in determining the ABI of a patient. Another study made use of microstimulators embedded in the skin to determine the ABI of a patient in real time. Now, while this second study was successfully tested in rats, it hasn't been fully tested or even approved for testing in human subjects. So its actual effectiveness in human subjects is still unknown. So basically, this means that for the moment, there are no proper non-invasive monitoring systems for PVD, which is exactly the research gap that the proponents want to solve. So as you can see in this slide, uh, there is an ankle brachial index skill. So I mentioned earlier that a ABI is actually the main variable used in determining if someone has PVD or not. So as seen, as seen in the scale, the normal ABPI range is 1 to 1.3. Anything below 1 is considered to be either borderline PVD or actual PVD, either ranging from mild to severe. Also, uh, an ABI value of 1.3 is also considered to be uh, someone with, sev with severe PVD because one of the symptoms of severe PVD is vessel hardening. So when the blood vessels harden, that actually results in a higher than normal ABI value being recorded by the test. For our methodology process, a study on peripheral vascular disease and related physiological parameters must be conducted. We reviewed similar studies regarding PVD diagnosis and how it is monitored, after which we designed a PVD monitoring system that incorporates the use of wireless body sensor networks. A neurofuzzy algorithm was designed and trained for the EBI calculation. Using the designed system, tests were performed and while the test results are unacceptable, we fix errors and redesign the system. We evaluate the accepted test results using statistical analysis and finally, we formulate conclusions and recommendations. For our conceptual framework, the inputs of the system include the ECG and PPG signals obtained from the patient. Their heart rate and blood oxygen saturation were obtained as well. These readings are transmitted to the servers where they are stored and processed. The raw signals were processed using filtering and peak finding methods to calculate for the physiological parameters needed in the study, particularly the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. 
the neurofuzzy system is trained and used to calculate for the ABI of the patient. The system also incorporated graphical representations of physiological parameters over time. For our block diagram, we have multiple sensor nodes, the ECG, PPG arm, and PPG leg sensor nodes, all of which incorporates a sensor that reads its corresponding signals. It also has a wireless transceiver that sends its data to a node MCU. The node MCU in turn sends the data to the server. We also have a web application wherein the signals can be viewed and all calculations can be seen. All data regarding the recordings are saved in a database. The neurofuzzy system was also implemented in MATLAB while the signal processing and linear regression was done in Python. As part of the web application, the determination of the needed parameters is shown. On the top is the processed ECG signal along with its detected RPX, while the bottom two are the same PPG signals which are processed. The systolic and diastolic peaks of the PPG signals are detected. In the second, it is shown that the PPG systolic signals are detected and are marked, while on the bottom, the PPG diastolic peaks are marked. All the values of the signals are normalized and the time frame was set wherein the detected peaks are evaluated. The R peak and systolic peak time is used in the calculation of systolic blood pressure, while the R peak and diastolic peak time is used in the calculation of diastolic blood pressure. Records can be seen in the web application and the training for the linear regression was incorporated. Each record consists of the heart rate, pulse transit time PTT, systolic blood pressure, R peak diastolic peak time RPDPT, and diastolic blood pressure. The pulse transit time is used to obtain a regression model for the systolic blood pressure, while the R-peak diastolic peak time is used to obtain a regression model for the diastolic blood pressure. The actual systolic and diastolic blood pressures are obtained using a commercially available blood pressure monitor, and the recordings on commercial devices are entered here to proceed with the training. All data that are to be part of the training can be selected as well. So this slide shows the step-by-step -step testing procedure that the proponents followed for this thesis study. So first, we obtained recordings of actual and experimental blood pressure values from multiple volunteers. So actually, each volunteer was subjected to multiple trials. And for the actual blood pressure values, we used commercial monitoring devices that you can buy off the counter. And for experimental blood pressure values, obviously, we made use of the fabricated prototype. So using the actual values, we calculated the ankle brachial index of the patient. And using the experimental values, we calculated the mean arterial pressure or the MAP of the patient. So these two values are actually equivalent to each other. So once enough data has been gathered and the data sets have been completed, we applied a statistical treatment on them. So the first is... The first statistical treatment that was applied was the R correlation test. So the reason this correlation test is being applied is to prove that pulse transit time can be used to derive the systolic blood pressure of the patient and the R peak diastolic peak time can be used to, to derive the diastolic blood pressure of the patient. By proving this, we can show that the values being gathered by the prototype are the correct values to be used in determining the overall blood pressure and by extension, the ABI of the user. So once this has been proven, we then subjected the data sets to a two-tailed t-test. So this particular statistical treatment is used to verify that there is no significant difference between the actual values and the estimated values. By proving this, we can show that the results generated by the prototype are of equal accuracy or roughly around the same accuracy as those generated by commercial devices. This means that the prototype can then be used feasibly in practical and real-life situations. So this slide actually shows the results of the correlation statistical treatment. Now, based on what we've read about correlation in our RRL, uh, an R value of 0 0.5 to 1 indicates strong relationship. So for this particular correlation test, the null, the null hypothesis, which is basically the hypothesis that we need to prove, is that the R value or the correlation value of PTT to systolic BP 
and RPDP T to diastolic BP is 0 0.5 or greater. So using 97 trials for both PPT and RPDPT, we then subjected those to the correlation test. And for PTT, we got a correlation value of 0 0.62. And for RPDPT, we had a correlation value of negative 0 0.51 or in absolute value 0 0.51. So, so since both of these values are actually over the 0 0.5 correlation value that I mentioned earlier, both of these tests actually accept the null hypothesis. So this proves that the post-transit time can then be used to compute for the systolic B BP and the RPDPT can then be used to compute for the diastolic BP. So this basically means that the values being derived and calculated by the prototype are the correct values to be used for this particular study. So this actually shows the correlation and linear regression model that was generated as a result of the training of the training that we conducted in the algorithm and the subsequent statistical treatment. So as you can see, the for PTT the correlation is positive. So basically, as PTT rises, the computed systolic blood pressure rises, and for RPDPT the correlation is negative. So if RPDPT rises, then the diastolic blood pressure actually decreases. So this particular slide, on the other hand, shows the results of the two tilt tests. Now for the estimated and actual values for systolic and diastolic BP, we once again made use of 97 trials for both of those tests. This was subjected to a 95% confidence interval. And based on a t-test table, that we referred to during the con during this test, the critical t-test value is plus or minus 1.985. So upon conducting the test for systolic blood pressure, the computed t-test value is negative 1.10195. And for diastolic blood pressure, it's actually negative 1.404675. So to prove that, so, so in a total t-test, to prove that there is no significant difference between two data sets, the computed value, or rather the computed absolute value, must be lower than the critical t-test value. So I mentioned earlier that the computed critical t-test value is plus or minus 1.985. Since both of the computed t-test values are less than this, this basically means that the null hypothesis is accepted and therefore there is no significant difference between the estimated and actual values. So this means that the accuracy of the prototype is comparable to those found in commercial recording devices for blood pressure. So this particular slide shows once again a total t-test but this time it's not for blood pressure, it's for MAP and ABI. Since these two are the main values being used to determine if a patient has PVD or not. So for this t-test, we use 71 trials and the computed t-test value is 1.5024. Again, the computed t-test value is less than, than the critical. So once again, there is no significant difference and the two values are comparable to each other. So overall, this basically means that the prototype is as expected and accurate. So for the conclusions of this study, based on the statistical treatments and the subsequent analysis conducted by the proponents, uh, the proponents have concluded that they have successfully developed a prototype that makes use of a wireless sensor network as well as a neurofuzzy algorithm to help diagnose and monitor PVD. Also, as explained in one of the objectives, the proponents have also success successfully developed a web application that patients and their medical personnel can use to actually view these results in real time. So uh, looking deeper into the results of the statistical treatment, the results basically show that the accuracy of the prototype is equivalent to those of commercial recording devices. So the proponents have also concluded that the device can be used prop, uh, properly and can be used to uh, accurately get the blood pressure and ABI of a patient in realistic situations. So for our recommendations, uh, in future iterations of the study, the software used to be the prototype can be employed on those with significant cardiovascular abnormalities so that uh, during training, the, the future versions will be more accurate and can take into account uh, multiple other factors. 
And the proponents also recommend that the scope of, of the device be expanded because for cardiovascular diseases, it was noted by the proponents that more or less the same psychological values are being monitored, such as blood pressure, heart rate, and so on. So since the device already monitors these values anyway, uh, in future versions, maybe instead of focusing solely on PVD, the device can be expanded to also help diagnose and monitor other cardiovascular diseases like stroke, uh, coronary heart disease, uh, high blood pressure, so on and so forth. 